Good evening. Today is Thursday, August 27th. Welcome to a special Facebook Live community briefing on the COVID-19 pandemic hosted by the Stanislaus County Office of Emergency Services. I'm Linda Muma with Stan OES. And I'm Amy Collier-Carroll, Public Information Officer with Stanislaus County. We will both be moderating tonight's live update, which will be recorded and later posted to the Stan Emergency Facebook page and YouTube channel. You won't see us on camera tonight, but you'll hear our voices as we direct your questions to our panelists. And because so many questions were submitted in advance of today's broadcast, we will likely only have time to address those this week. Tonight, Stanislaus County Public Health Nurse Manager Julie Falkenstein is here for the first time. And she's joined by Stanislaus County Office of Education Superintendent Scott Kuykendall and County Epidemiologist Chelsea Donahue with us here tonight as well. Let's begin this tonight's discussion with a public health update. It's been a few weeks since our last panel discussion, so we'll start with Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea, can you give us a snapshot of where we are today and then also bring us up to speed on how things have changed since the start of August when we held our last community briefing? Certainly. So right now, Stanislaus County has 14,101 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in our community. We've also unfortunately experienced 245 COVID-19 related deaths, which we recognize as a great loss to our community. Uh, as many of you may have noticed, uh, after July 4th, we experienced a large increase in cases. Fortunately, over the past couple weeks, we've started to see a decline in cases, which we thank the community for their social distancing efforts and the wearing uh, face coverings, which has really contributed to the, the decrease in cases. Even with this decrease though, we're still about double our case rate of what we were seeing at this beginning of June. So we ask community members to continue to practice these F prevention efforts. Um, and also if they are experiencing COVID-19 symptoms or they are been exposed to a confirmed COVID-19 case, we still recommend getting tested. Um, another change we've noticed in the past couple weeks is a marked decline in testing turnaround times for our testing sites. You know, and I believe you're the first uh, epidemiologist we've had join us. Will you just briefly explain what an epi epidemiologist is and what it is that you, you do exactly? Certainly. So an epidemiologist is someone who tracks disease trends. So essentially we take a look at who a disease is impacting, what communities are being adversely impacted, how health disparities contribute to those impacts, and what prevention efforts um, we can implement to decrease the spread of a disease. Thank you, Chelsea. We'll stay with you for just a moment. You mentioned testing a, a second ago. Mm -hmm. So our COVID-19 percentage of positive numbers are declining locally. Are we seeing less illness or just less testing? And then are we testing enough of our population? Yeah, that's a really good question. So that's always something we consider when we look at case rates. Um, when we're seeing the overall number of tests being performed and resulting back to uh, among our residents, we are seeing the testing rates stabilize over the past couple weeks, so we're not seeing a marked decline. That being said, that's why we also always look at percent uh, positivity yield. So of the people being tested, what percent are positive? This helps account not just for case rate or number of tests, but also looks at the proportion of people testing positive. So really looking at those two numbers together is what gives us that holistic picture of what the trends are in our community. Um, as far as the number of people are we testing enough in our community, currently we do have availability uh, at all three of our testing sites, which is in Turlock, Salida, and West Modesto. Um, so again, if you're experiencing any symptoms or you're concerned about an exposure to COVID-19, we still recommend getting tested because that's our greatest surveillance tool to know what COVID-19 trends are like in our community right now. Chelsea, we'll stay with you for just a minute because we had a couple of questions um, over the, the course of this week about testing. So can you speak to test turnaround time and the availability of testing in our, in our county? Yeah, certainly. So right now, um, as I previously mentioned, we do have testing. Uh, our testing sites have appointments, same day appointments available. So anyone who wants to test, um, we do have availability currently to test those people. Um, we know that turnaround time was something a lot of people who are utilizing our testing sites, the long turnaround time was a big concern. It was a concern for us as well. So as a team, we've really been working to get those testing turnaround times decreased. Right now, um, people who were tested last week, we're seeing them get results back. 
an average of a little less than four days. So testing turnaround times have been trending down. Thank you, Chelsea. We're going to shift gears a little bit and talk to Superintendent Kuykendall about how things are going for students in our county. Scott, how is distance learning going so far this school year for our school districts? So distance learning is kind of a broad topic. So first of all, I think it's important, and everybody probably already knows this, that it's not anybody's first choice, right? So let me talk about distance learning maybe in three different categories. Let me talk first about kind of technically how it's going and how it's rolling out. Um, we'll talk a little bit about instructionally, how that's happening, and then lastly, just the impact on families. So um, technically, as can be expected, the rollout of distance learning did have some turbulence at the beginning of the year. Um, first and foremost, on the county office um, side of the house, we had some issues with our own firewall which failed on the same day that we were supposed to do a countywide internet stress test. So really it just kind of goes hand in hand with 2020. If it can go wrong, it probably will. Um, that prevented some of our districts from actually accessing the internet on that day. And we had a few districts that were already instructing students. So that was problematic. And then it depends on your district, but um, there have been other issues as far as students being able to log on, um, different um, issues with the student information systems, talking to the learning management systems. I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but districts didn't really know and couldn't test for the technical side of it until all of the students and all the teachers were online and then the volume could then be experienced and then those different situations produce problems that had to be worked through. So we really appreciate everybody's patience. We anticipated that these things were going to happen. I think that for the most part things have smoothed out over the last couple of weeks as, um, as distance learning has rolled out on the technical side. I know that devices have been um, issued to students and where broadband or internet access isn't provided, then um, hotspots have been given out really just to make sure that most of our students, as many as possible, are connected. So instructionally, I'm, I just really want to commend our teachers because they're making a really a valiant effort in providing quality instruction within this distance learning vehicle, if you will. So teachers have never worked harder. And just speaking from somebody um, with experience with this, I currently have two children at home um, who are involved with distance learning. So I understand the complexity and sometimes the difficulty. But um, our districts really are trying to do all they can for our students and working with families as far as the instruction, as far as the scheduling goes, and as far as that ongoing communication. Lastly, just that whole idea of the impact of distance learning on families. And I think I alluded to that earlier just with my own experience with my wife and our two children who are at home. I know that this is difficult and I know that it's challenging, especially when you've got younger children in the home who are of grades, let's say kindergarten, you know, through third, who can't do a lot independently. I absolutely understand all of that. So keep hanging there. Um, things are looking better as far as our numbers here in Stanislaus County. And then I'll talk a little bit more about some allowances. Um, as far as the waiver process that is, um, that is coming our way, as well as the opportunity for small group instruction. So I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as, we, as we go further. But that's kind of in a nutshell um, how distance learning is going here in Stanislaus County. Thank you, Scott. I know you could probably answer this question, but I uh, want to get to uh, Julie Falkenstein, our, our public health nurse manager here. Julie, what what do uh, what does the California Department of Public Health guidelines say about when we can reopen schools safely? So those guidelines vary based on the age of the students. Um, if we're talking 
transitional kindergarten through sixth grade, we actually have an opportunity to potentially start school for them earlier um, than for our junior high and high school students. We need to get to the point where we are under 200 cases of COVID per 100,000 people every day. Um, and that's a rolling 14 day average. And we're getting there, we're not there yet. Um, and once we get there, then we can look at waivers and plans essentially to keep kids, to reduce the risk as much as possible for kids going back to in-person learning. Our junior high and high school students won't be going back until after we are actually off the, the state's watch list. So we actually need to get down under 100 cases um, per 100,000 people um, for 14 days before we can let our older kids go back to school. Wow, thank you. So we have told districts in our county recently that they can begin applying for a waiver to reopen schools. So who decides whether a district's elementary school um, open waiver is approved? Is it the state or is it the county public health department? And what is the process on that? How long will it take? There's probably, I'm gonna say about three different levels to opening back up our schools and the waiver process. The first one actually has to do with each of us individually. Um, in order to hit that baseline um, infection number, we all need to be wearing our masks and practicing social distancing um, because that's the only way that as a community we're gonna be able to allow our schools to open. After that, what's gonna happen is our schools will fill out an application. Um, it's a waiver application that is really attached to their reopening plan about how they're gonna reduce the risk in the school of COVID transmission. They will submit that to public health. Um, it goes to SCO to go up on their website and then it comes to public health for review. We will go through that. We have a, a checklist that we've provided to schools um, and we will go through that checklist and their plan and have feedback back and forth in discussion um, about where the, the plan is. Um, once we've, there's several of us that are reviewing each plan, so it's not just one person kind of making a decision, it's a couple of us together. It then goes to Dr. V for her to sign off on it, and then we will send it up to the state. And so then the state's got three days to reply back to us as to whether or not they've approved it. So there's multiple tiers to reopening our schools under the waiver process. Thank you so much. Um, let's head back over uh, to Chelsea. Chelsea, we've now reached close to 250 COVID-19 deaths in our county. Most of those victims had underlying conditions, uh, which we have discussed in the past. Can you share what the most common underlying health conditions have been in terms of who has contracted and uh, died from the virus? Yeah, so that's correct. We've unfortunately, we're getting close to that 250 mark for COVID-19 deaths in our community. Um, as you mentioned, we are seeing people with comorbidities uh, more adversely impacted by this virus. It's still a new virus, so we're learning a lot about what comorbidities impact people and at what levels and where we're seeing more severe outcomes with one uh, underlying condition versus another. The data, though, is pretty consistent in showing people who are experiencing underlying conditions like cancer, diabetes, asthma, um, chronic kidney disease, heart conditions, uh, all obesity, um, all of these underlying conditions have been shown to have that severe adverse health outcome. And so we really ask those high risk populations to make sure they're taking the needed precautions to prevent contracting COVID-19. And people are living with family members who have those underlying conditions, making sure they can do everything they can to prevent um, people with those health conditions from contracting this virus. Thank you, Chelsea. A lot of people are tracking information about how many people have died and that sort of thing on our website where we have dashboards available. But for a couple of weeks, we did have to take down our dashboards and now we've put them back up. Can you explain what was going on with our dashboards during that time? And if the information that's up there now is accurate and up to date? Yeah. So starting on August 5th, we had to take down our dashboard um, for a brief time due to an ongoing issue that was being experienced with the state's surveillance system called CalReady. 
essentially that issue prevented electronic lab reports from laboratories who were producing those COVID-19 results to getting to local health jurisdictions. So because we weren't getting consistent incoming data, we didn't have consistent data to show to the public, to show to the community um, on our dashboard. So that's why it was taken down briefly. Once we were assured by the state that that reporting error had been fixed within CalReady and that all local health jurisdictions were getting um, the reported test, we were able then to put the dashboard back up and um, the data be that, being report that is being reported now, um, the state has assured us we are getting all lab results. You know, this is um, a kind of a similar question, but it really has to do with numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the state's CalReady system glitches did cause some confusion there regarding what our numbers were in Stanislaus County for a few weeks. Mm -hmm. Have those issues been worked out at the state and do our numbers now match or is there any sort of lag? Yeah, so I know that's been a really large concern we've been hearing and seeing on our end too. This idea of what is the daily fluctuation of numbers and why wouldn't a number being reported by the county match the states and vice versa. So one thing um, we like to uh, let people know is that the exact number of case counts can be impacted by when the data is retrieved. So we will, based on when that data retrieval happens, our, the state's number and our number may differ. Um, the other thing we ask people to look at is, I know that daily case rate can, or not case rate, that daily case count can go up and down. Um, but in order to see what trends are going on in the community, what COVID-19 spread looks like in our community, we ask them to look at those other numbers, like case rates, like testing positivity yield. And the reason why we have those numbers up there is because that's not just a snapshot in time, right? That's not just a single day we're looking at data. That looks at cumulative counts, that averages counts, and it also does some lagging. So it, 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 we look back a couple days. So we know that the data we're reporting and the trends we're reporting is m a more holistic picture of what current trends look like. Um, so there are lags and that's what's happening with those daily case counts. But if you look at the more holistic pictures like rates and positivity yields, those are gonna help uh, give you a better idea of what trends are like in Stan Stanislaus County. Thank you, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. Let's go to Superintendent Sky Scott Kuykendall again. And we'd like to talk for a little bit about school waivers. Julie Falkenstein brought this up just a moment ago when we were talking about it related to public health, but let's talk about it related to our districts. First of all, who makes the decision to submit a waiver on behalf of a school or school district? And do you expect all the public schools will request waivers to open elementary schools soon? So the first part of the question is um, really who makes the decision? And, and the decision really is made you know, by the superintendent um, obviously, the board is going to be involved in that decision as well. And then there are other stakeholders that are involved in that process. Um, there needs to be information gathering and input given by both parents and employees of that district. So that's all part of the process before it gets submitted. Um, do I think that all of our schools are going to apply for a waiver? I would say yes. Um, I think that timing though may be um, one of the issues. The waiver is going to be fantastic, especially for our smaller school districts um, who already have smaller class sizes. Um, they're going to easily be able to meet all the different criteria, quite frankly, of the waivers moving forward. Um, our bigger districts are going to have a have a harder time meeting all the different criteria as far as um, keeping classes smaller, the social distancing piece, um, some of these other factors. I'm not saying that it can't be done, but it's going to be more difficult for our larger districts to do that. There's also the idea that districts may want to wait and see what happens. And I would say that this could come from what I would describe as a, an abundance of caution, let's say. We know that in Stanislaus County, when we've had Mother's Day, when we've had Fourth of July, when we've had these different holidays, and we've got another one coming up as far as Labor Day, um, we've seen an increase in, in cases. So there may be some districts who just want to um, bide some time, 
see what happens in our, in our community, make sure that it's safe before they open, and then move forward that way. So you're going to have both in our county. You're going to have folks who are submitting the waiver as soon as they can wanting to open, and then you're gonna have some who perhaps are a little more reticent, a little more cautious, really wanting to see what happens, and that's also those large, like I said, those larger districts, it's gonna take them longer to plan and implement as they're, as they're moving forward as well. So you're saying if a school district decides not to apply for a waiver, it would just be out of a, ca a standpoint of caution to see what happens and some other considerations. Absolutely. So will the school waiver plans be made public for parents to read? Absolutely, and that's part of the state requirement. And we've already partnered with County Health. So all of the waivers that are submitted are posted on the Stanislaus County Office of Education webpage. So that's stanco.org, and then you can just look for um, COVID-19 resources and you will find those waivers listed there so they're they are there for the public to see absolutely thank you scott let's head back over to julie uh julie we have said that it isn't up to us to make the determination about whether or not schools reopen so can you please explain why schools are being asked to submit a waiver to reopen yeah so the state has um set the guidelines for school reopening. Those aren't set locally. And so the state, some of the guidelines are the fact that they have to submit their plan to safely reopen and the waiver application that goes with that. And then they also, we also have to know that where we are with the data and know that we're under that 200 per 100,000 um, 14 day case rate. So it's it's a state decision as to when our schools reopen. Thank you, Julie. So another question that came in and you probably just answered it was, how is it determined whose waiver is approved? And I think you talked about this a moment ago. The state makes the final decision. Is there anything else you'd like to clarify or elaborate? So we've that? tried, our public health goal is to be as open and transparent with our districts and our families as we can with the waivers. Um, we've put into process a checklist so that everyone is, has got the same template that they're following. Um, we've got more than one person reviewing every application so we don't have reviewer bias. Um, and then we're, we're working in tandem with the schools on their waivers. So our goal is to be as open about that as possible um, and, and move that through. Scott, I think uh, you had something that you wanted to add to that. I did. Okay. So um, as we're going through this waiver process, which is new for everyone, again, going back to the distance learning, we know that it's nobody's first choice. Um, I'm just asking that folks be patient because even with the submitting of a waiver, there's still the approval process. And even when we do get below 100 cases per 100,000, and we're talking about our 712 students, there is still really a 17 day wait and making sure that we get off of the monitoring list. So I just want, I just want folks to understand that just because we get under that 200 mark doesn't mean that our schools are going to open up that next week. Okay, there's still going to be a several week process for us to plan and what we haven't talked about yet, and we probably will, is the fact that we have to have the capacity here in Stanislaus County to ensure that all of our educational staff, so that's teachers, that's administrators, that's office staff, that's transportation, that's everybody that works in schools, is tested at least once every two months, roughly. So that's about 300 tests a day, just ballparking it. So we need to make sure that all of those different things are accounted for and that we have the capacity to do what's needed in order to not only open schools, but to keep them open, keep our students safe and our staff safe as well. I think uh, we'll, we'll stick with you for just a second. I think uh, Julie had hinted towards this earlier, but there was a question on um, elementary schools versus junior high schools and kind of a separate plan for each one depending mm -hmm. on the students ages can you kind of explain what factored into that yeah the it's it will be easier to open 
elementary schools first, and so I'm talking about grades K through six. Um, there's some there's some medical reasons for that because we know that kids are less likely to get COVID-19 as well as transmit it at that at those younger ages, but also they're in the same classroom, so you can keep the cohorts the same, right, with the same adults working with those students, and that as far as a contract tr tracing. Um, issue can be more easily resolved at the elementary levels. Seven, you know, junior high and high school, it becomes more problematic because just the way that our schools are set up, you have cohorts of students now who are changing classes throughout the day, they're mixing, and that's really where it gets problematic is when you have students that are mixing. If you do have a positive case, then that student has likely um, um, basically, you know, I don't want to call them a super spreader, but has had the ability to spread to different classrooms throughout the day. How do you track everything down? How do you then find out who is actually exposed, who's not? So it's those types of things that need to be worked out as we're bringing back junior high and high school. And again, we want all of our students obviously to be back in school. We just need to be very thoughtful about how we do that. Thank you, Scott. When do you anticipate 7th through 12th grade students will return to the classrooms? <laughs> That's a great question. I wish I, you know, I wish I could say, um, you know, wow, it's, I would, again, having a junior high and a high school student at home, you know, I would love to say uh, tomorrow, but that's, that's not realistic. Um, I think we really need to do a good job, first of all, as a county to keep our numbers low. I think we also need to be truly effective at how we're bringing our junior high students back. So the better that we can do both of those things, our elementary students, as a community, being responsible, keeping our numbers low, um, the sooner we will be able to bring our junior high and high school students back. As far as sports, and, you know, this might be a good guideline, you know, the CIF who regulates high school sports um, here in the state of California has really defined that its season will be from January through June. So I would love to see our high school and junior high students come back before second semester, but it's really going to be up to us to make that happen. Thank you, Scott. Let's head over to, to Chelsea. This is a question that came in on Facebook uh, earlier in the week. Um, this person you know, highlights, you know, a lot of residents have been confused about our numbers and have been concerned about the opening of schools. And so this question is a good example. They, they said, um, Kristen Olson, for example, um, had said recently that our cases per 100 are approaching 200 and schools can apply for a waiver to reopen. But in Modesto City Schools, a presentation to parents the day before, uh, this person was told that uh, we are three times the rate we need to be for a waiver at 615 per 100,000. And the same day, the LA Times said that we were at about 667 per 100,000 residents. So how can school waivers be considered and what is the correct information? Yeah, I know it can be really tricky when we're looking at case rates. So with a case rate, it's how you calculate it and what day or date you consider when we're looking at 14 days. And so the state and Stanislaus County use something called episode date. An episode date is essentially the earliest date that person is known to have COVID-19 or that infection. So it's a couple of things that determine that date, things like date of symptom onset or the date the, their test was collected, their specimen collection date. But that's the date we use when we're saying what the past 14 day case rate is. And so we look at the cumulative 14 days cases for using episode date per 100,000. And so when we do that calculation, we're, we're at that, I think we're at um, 235.8 today. Uh, however, if you use the report date, so that's the date we're reporting out that positive case, um, you can get a much higher number. So using just report date, it's closer to 600. And the reason why that's so different is because as you guys have been seeing, there's fluctuating cases every day. 
Unfortunately, not all those cases you see reported that day necessarily are recent cases. So we looked at the cases that were reported yesterday, for instance. 74% of those cases we got yesterday had an episode date within the past two weeks. So those cases would be used to calculate that 14-day case rate. 26% of those cases, however, had an episode date that was more than two weeks ago. And that can be caused by a variety of things. It can be caused by delayed reporting. It can be caused by um, delay in the healthcare facility reporting to us. It can be caused by delayed testing turnaround time. But that number isn't consistent and it's not stable. So when we're looking at what's happening now, we want to look at people who had an infection within the past 14 days. And so that's why we like to use episode date rather than that report date. If we're having something consistent, we'll see that report date and episode date, those rates should be fairly similar, but things like when CalReady went down, right? And so we got a large amount of cases reported over the past couple weeks, that's really gonna create that report date case rate to go up. So we really wanna stick with that stable episode date case rate. Um, and that's what that's the rate we're gonna be using both to see what current transmission looks like in our community. And that's also the rate that's being used to determine um, that school opening eligibility as well. Thank you, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. Another question for you. So a lot of people, as we talked about a moment ago, are looking at the dashboards on our website to track how we're doing in our county. This question came in from Facebook. It says, I see that the county dashboard is back. Thank you. However, one of the most useful tabs, variance, is now missing. When do you anticipate that tab will be working? Yeah, so we definitely have heard the communities um, want to have that tab back on. So the variance tab is now available on the county dashboard. Um, all the metrics that were there are there with the exception of uh, ventilator availability percentage and the reason why that one's not uh, that metric is not on there is because the state has changed the definition of ventilator in order to better capture ventilators being used for COVID-19 patients so we're working right now with our healthcare facilities to get that definition updated and once we have that data standardized and being reported um, we are going to have that metric available again. But the county variance, um, we really appreciate that it's being uh, used and that it's useful to the community. So we wanted to put it back up there. Let's go back to Julie. Speaking of variance, uh, this was a question that came in on Facebook. Considering how the last variance turned out, putting us among the highest cases in the state, is it wise to consider asking for another variance against the state's mandates for opening schools? So I, I think that question is actually about, is it safe to apply for waivers for our elementary schools? And I would say that we're actually not going against the, the state requirements. We're following state guidelines. Um, we are moving forward with an abundance of caution and um, we won't, schools won't open until we reach the appropriate case rate and we have the appropriate plans in place for risk reduction for our students and teachers. Another Facebook question for you, Julie, while we have you. This one's from a local teacher who asks, will the waiver for kindergarten through sixth grade be revoked if our county case numbers start to surge again? So, Right now, the state guidelines, and the th well, let me back up. So the thing to remember about the, st the state legal orders and guidelines is that they are the minimum of what we need to do as a county. They don't define the most conservative action we can take. They really define the minimum action we can take. And so right now, those guidelines um, tell us when we can shut a classroom or, or guide us in when to shut a classroom and quarantine the students, when to quarantine a school, when to quarantine an entire district, potentially. Um, and right now the guidelines actually say that if numbers go back up above that 200 rate for the 14-day case rate, we don't actually have to close schools again. Um, and I think one of the concerns is that we don't really want to be bouncing kids in and out of schools. Um, and we have local decision-making ability with this. So Dr. V has been working with the school superintendents and will continue to work with the school superintendents 
And that will be a decision that we make as we're monitoring all of the COVID activity once the schools open for in-person learning again. And it's, it's gonna be on a situation basis, depending upon how each school is responding and what the, what the COVID situation looks like in each setting. Scott, this is a similar question for you. Uh, when students do return to the classroom and there is a positive COVID case reported, will the school close again? And if so, for how long? So I think what Julie uh, may have been referring to as well is because within the state guidelines, there's also a matrix. And it really is kind of, uh, if you have this situation or scenario, that will then dictate these actions. So if you have a student who is a who is just um, showing symptoms, then you would send that student home, okay? Or if you have a student who is a positive um, case and you discover that on a campus, then you would follow a different set of protocols as far as now we're looking at not only sending the student home, contacting public health, doing some contact tracing, um, seeing where that student was. So that matrix is already spelled out. So, so districts have a template, they have guidelines, if you will, to follow as we're moving forward with this. And we know that um, we will have positive cases. I mean, that's just, that's just something that's going to happen. Um, probably more likely actually with our staff than, than students typically. So we know that this is likely going to happen and we can plan for that. And this almost goes back to that other question about, you know, would there be a reason why districts wouldn't apply for a waiver as soon as possible? And that is another, that is another um, argument that you don't want to have the yo-yo effect of getting kids back into school only, like we're seeing at some universities, especially back east, only then to cancel school, everybody goes back home, and now we're on distance learning, um, you know, temporarily until things come together. So there is a plan in place. Um, there are that there is that matrix that's worked out, and that's what our our school leaders will be following once schools come back online. Thank you, Scott. You spoke about this a moment ago, um, but it's a two-part question, and I think it's worth asking because the second part we haven't addressed. So the question is, if and when the opening of schools happens, what are the guidelines for staff and student testing if there is a suspected exposure? Suspe su I'm sorry, suspected exposure. And secondly, is there talk of a COVID vaccine becoming mandated for enrollment in public school? So the first part of the question, I think, yeah, I think I, I did address, you know, so if you have, um, if you have a student who has tested positive for COVID-19, um, obviously there are steps that you would take to figure out, you know, where that student has been, what kind of contact have they had with other staff or students, and then you would, um, you would respond appropriately. I have not heard of anything about a COVID vaccine becoming mandated uh, for a public school. And quite frankly, um, I would be very much opposed to that. I mean, if, if in fact there is a vaccine, obviously it, it, should, be, it should be voluntary, just like our, our flu shots are now. Thank you, Scott. Let's go over to our public health epidemiologist, Chelsea. Uh, Chelsea, this also is a question that came in on Facebook. It came actually popped up a couple of times. Um, we know that our numbers have tapered off. However, we get a notice every day uh, via text saying that our numbers are inaccurate. This is referring to the Stanaware text notification. How can we apply for variance without uh, accurate data? I think you hinted towards this earlier, but um, if you could clarify. Sir, yeah, certainly. And as an epidemiologist, accurate data is always something we're concerned about when we're looking at the numbers and completeness of the data. Um, so we were in communication, ongoing communication with the state to verify that the error they were seeing with their reporting system had been corrected and that we were in fact getting the lab results um, were being transmitted correctly to local health jurisdictions. Uh, we had a conversation with the state yesterday and they stated that CalReady had been fixed. Um, on, there were no longer any ongoing issues. Um, they identified a few days from the end of July and a few days at the beginning of August. 
that we still had data gaps in and they're working to reprocess those gaps. But since we are 14 days past those um, gap days and the state has stated that the issues have been fixed, that disclaimer has been removed. And we are obviously working to constantly verify that our data is complete as it, as it can be and also making sure that we are in communication with the state to identify any emerging errors. When we put those disclaimers up, we always want to be as transparent with the public as possible. And so those disclaimers, the intention of them is to let them know if we are getting any communication, then we want to be sure that uh, we are then communicating those errors to the public as well. Julie, did you want to add to that as well? Yeah, because I've heard a, a version of that question about the data. And I think it's important that people know that both numbers are accurate in their own way. Now, that said, now that we've fixed the CalReady breaking issue, um, I'm a little less technical with that stuff. I'm going to say CalReady broke. <laughs> um, and we, we had data issues there for a while. But the numbers, when we started texting out numbers every day to the community, what we were texting out and what we continue to text out are the number of cases reported to us on that day. Um, and Chelsea talked about the, the fact that that number is really influenced by lab turnaround time, um, by data glitches, by just odd things that happen in the world of technology and in 2020. And, and so that number doesn't, that number reflects what all the new cases we get each day, but it doesn't look at what the disease prevalence is in the community. And so the, the 14 day case rate average is looking at, um, Chelsea called it the episode date. Um, I might call it the disease onset date. Um, and so it is the day that someone got sick. And so we'll look at the first day symptoms started for them, or we'll look at the day their lab test was done because some people are asymptomatic. And um, that date is, it takes longer to get those numbers because you have to be able to do the case investigation. And you have to call the family and talk to the family and, or the person, depending upon the age of the individual, and, and gather all of that information. And so it causes a delay in how quickly that number comes out. And so the number we're texting out is, is accurate in so much that that's how many positive cases are reported to us. It doesn't reflect where we are actually with the level of disease, the level of COVID in our community. That number takes a little bit longer and that's the number we have to follow for schools and for our waiver for schools and for the watch list because that, that better reflects what the level of disease in the community is. Great job clarifying, Julie. Thank you so much. I'm going to hang out with you for just a second because we had so many really good questions come in for public health over the last couple of weeks. We asked Superintendent Kuykendall a moment ago about uh, COVID vaccine being mandated for enrollment in public schools. So I have a vaccine question for you. Okay. If you've already had the virus, is it necessary to receive the vaccine? That is a really good question and one that we don't have an answer to yet. Um, I think what's fascinating about COVID is that it has only existed, COVID-19 has, or SARS-CoV, if you really want to get technical, it's only existed for about nine months. And so there is so much we don't know about it. Um, we don't know how long immunity lasts once you get it. Is it going to be something like the chicken pox, which our older population will know about, that you know, once you got chicken pox, you weren't really likely to get it again it would show back up as shingles later in your life, but like you never got chicken pox the second time. Or is it gonna be something more like the flu where we have to vaccine, we have to, we have to vaccinate, sorry, about it every year. And so until the disease has been in the community, in, in the world longer, we're not gonna have a really good answer about who needs to be vaccinated and who doesn't and how long the vaccine will last and how long immunity lasts. Um, so that is something where they're focusing a lot of research on at the moment. This question just kind of it popped up. I think there's been in other communities, um, maybe a handful of, of people that have 
actually contracted it twice. Have we had any incidences like that in our county, that you, to your knowledge? So we just had an article just came out of Hong Kong where they had someone who had it originally about four months ago, um, recovered, went to Europe, came back, got it again. In both of those situations, they actually had been able to gene se sequence um, the version of COVID-19 that he had. And it was actually two different versions of COVID. There was enough um, uh, mutation between the two that he was able to be reinfected um, again four months later. There are folks that appear to have gotten it a second time. This is the first time we've really seen that level of detail. Um, most people, at least within the first three months after infection, don't seem to be getting it again. Um, I'm not sure that we've had any documented kind of repeat cases in our community, but we also have had COVID in our community a lot shorter of a period of time than Hong Kong and some of our, our Asian counterparts. Thank you, Julie. Let's go to Scott Kuykendall. Shifting gears back to schools. So we've heard a lot about day camps that have cropped up and other alternate gatherings of students. If a school is not open for in-person instruction, is it okay for a small group of students to receive in-person targeted specialized support and services on campus? As of this week, it is. And we just got that new guidance um, earlier this week. This has been a point of frustration for schools because we had some guidelines for day camps where they, it was permissible to have small groups of students if you only had a very limited number of adults working with them and you kept the cohorts the same and you were trying to do as much outdoors as possible. So schools have now, in a sense, been given that same permission. And it's, it's really crucial because in Stanislaus County, I mean, we do have groups of students that really don't have access to the internet, which makes distance learning impossible, you know, and I'm thinking, I was talking to the superintendent out in Roberts Ferry, who has the LaGrange area, so, you know, kind of our eastern Stanislaus County areas, where there's not a lot of connectivity, so this now gives him the opportunity to bring in small groups of students and work with them. Now, again, there are guidelines, and, um, and those need to be adhered to. So you can never have more than, let's say, 25% of your total student population on your campus at any given time. But for working with those students with no connectivity, with working for students um, who are English learners, with working with students um, who um, are in special education, um, that's fantastic. For our homeless youth and even foster youth, so some of our youth that are really at risk and distance learning, perhaps is not only a connectivity issue, but you know, you have issues going on, you know, within the home or within the particular culture. So it allows schools now to begin working with small groups of students in a very safe environment. You still have PPE, again, that cohort thing where you're keeping the same students together with the same adults, and they can only be two in a class, two adults in a classroom, and that's it. Um, so that's, that's at least something, and that's a starting point. So we are excited about that moving forward. This, uh, Scott, by the way, is, is what you were referring to earlier as pods? Right. So um, you may also heard, yeah, these smaller groups, you may have heard of them as, as learning pods. Um, I believe that there was an article just in today's Modesto B about this whole thing. So the guidelines are, are relatively new. We've been wanting these to come out. We've been waiting for, it seems like forever for them to come out. But now that they're finally here, so this does give our, our schools um, an opportunity to meet with students that they really know um, distance learning for whatever reason isn't working. Let's stick with you for just a moment um, because we've had a lot of questions, you know, even since the pandemic first started about sports. So for example, kids who are seniors in high school uh, who play football, will they have an opportunity to play this year? So that's absolutely what we're all hoping for. The plan right now is that the official high school sports season would actually start in January. And then each of those seasons, so your fall sports season, winter and spring would all be truncated. So, you know, they're all going to be much shorter than they would be typically. You're not going to have as many games, let's say, 
but then you would still have a fall sports season, and that includes obviously football and volleyball and all of those things, as a winter, which would then include basketball as well, um, and then you know spring, you know baseball. Um, obviously, that's not all the sports that are that you know students participate in, but you know that just gives you an example of how that would work. So uh, that's the plan, the plan right now. Um, and I hope that I hope that it, it stays and that I hope that our young um, men and women who are in high school, you know, and who really thrive um, on athletics will be able to have that opportunity and hopefully starting in January. That sounds good. So let's stick with you. Um, one more question for you before we move on here. So a lot of schools reopened this fall this month around the country. Has your team been tracking how that has gone for those schools and whether or not schools that opened in early August remain open today? So what we've what we've seen primarily and what we've been what we've been looking at primarily is what's been going on with universities and those universities that have attempted to open and have done so unsuccessfully and really what we found is that the majority of the problems are really you've got large groups, um, especially of young college students who are off campus. Um, again, um, meeting in large groups, no social distancing, no masks, and then coming back onto campus and then it really spreading. So I am of the opinion that if in fact schools do this and we're responsible, and I absolutely believe that we will be, um, we will be able to open schools and successfully keep them open. Obviously, not only do we have PPE that's been provided to schools, um, we also have the different you know, regulations and guidelines that will be having to happen. We will have mandatory testing for all of our employees um, at the school site as well. So there's a variety of things that will be happening, including the fact that we're going to be starting slower. So, you know, we're, we're going to be opening up with our younger students, becoming successful, and then building um, on that momentum. Thank you, Scott. Uh, let's head back over to Julie. Julie, this is a message that came in on Facebook uh, this week as well. Are the local health department and school officials, including school nurses, a part of the planning process for when schools reopen uh, in person? It seems that uh, this person points out that other health departments in the state have collaborated with school nurses to ensure that students uh, and staff safety needs are met. Yeah, and we, we certainly are. We love our school nurses in this community. And from a public health standpoint, um, as public health nurses, they really are our partners in um, the whole continuum of ensuring the public's health. And they are often the first line um, of defense and the first group of people that see what's going on within our student community. Um, and so yes, we most certainly <laughs> are partnering with them. Um, we've got a group going right now that includes school nurses from Modesto City Schools, um, SCO and MJC. Um, we've got a couple administrators on that work group as well. Um, we would love to have more school nurses um, come and participate. I know that we're working on scheduling a meeting um, for public health with all of the school nurses to try to answer some of those questions and, and kind of go through some of the finer details that nurses kind of nerd out on when it comes to this stuff <laughs> um, and, and really kind of take that stuff apart. So yes, we are definitely working with our school nurses. Um, there's no way we could do this without them. Thank you, Julie. Another question for Superintendent Kuykendall, talking about the safety of schools and school nurses. So someone has asked if schools will have the PPE they need to keep mm -hmm. students, teaching staff, and faculty safe. safe. Right, no, absolutely. Um, but before I answer that question, I just want to um, compliment Julie. So what she didn't tell you was is that she was actually on an hour-long call with all the county superintendents um, last week, and then she will be on our call again tomorrow. So. All of the questions that we have as far as waivers and reopening and um, guidelines, um, Julie's been fantastic as far as being there and answering those questions. So the PPE question is yes, students, teaching staff and faculty will all have PPE um, when schools reopen. The County Office of Education acted as kind of a distribution hub. The state purchased 
quantities of masks, um, both student and staff masks, face shields for, for teachers specifically, touchless thermometers, and also a large quantity of hand sanitizer um, for all of our districts up and down the state. It's really a two month supply in the meantime, our own districts have been allocating additional PPE supplies that they know um, they may need more longer term. So for an initial um, reopening of schools, absolutely, the, the districts have what they need. And then on their own, they've been acquiring um, additional PPE as necessary. And Scott, you know, for parents that are still a little hesitant to send, you know, their kids to school when schools mm -hmm. do reopen, we did have a question, when schools do reopen for in-classroom instruction, will parents keep the option to continue distance learning with their children? So if parents would like to continue with the distance learning option, absolutely. That would be, that would be made available. And that was going to be made available to parents even before all of our districts were more or less, you know, kind of forced into going into this distance learning model. So that we, we understand that there are parents who have concerns um, and we want to make sure that they understand that if they're more comfortable with their child in a distance learning or independent study situation, that absolutely they'll be able to do that. Thank you, Scott. One more question for Julie. So we've talked about what our rates have to be for um, waivers to be approved and how schools can reopen, but we didn't really talk about that checklist that you referenced and what will be required. And this question came in that I think you could probably answer. How much spacing will be required for students in the classroom if a waiver is granted? So the state um, is pretty clear that adults need to stay six feet away from students. We know particularly with this younger group, um, adults transmit both get and transmit COVID easier than our students do. And so that's fairly clear that the adults are gonna need to be six feet away. Um, the students, they're more open with what that might look like. Um, it could be spacing of desks, it could be partitions on desks that provide space or provide barriers. Um, if we think about spacing, and this is true in a classroom just as much as it's true in the line at Costco, um, Three feet is good. You get good coverage from three feet. Six feet is better. Nine feet is even better yet. Um, and so, but we also have to think about what, what our classrooms look like. And if we have nine feet of space between students, how many students could you actually have in the classroom? So, which is why the state allows for some other barrier methods of um, spacing with students. Scott, we had a, another question for you, and you're going to have to help me with this acronym, um, but this came in an email. Will SDC classes be included to return in K-6 waivers uh, district uh -huh. will apply, districts will apply for? Is there any additional guidance to get the, the mod severe special ed classes back on campus? So the answer is, so this is a special education um, program. And the answer now is because we have the permissions to do small group instruction, we can begin working with small groups of students um, within those parameters. So, so the, the quick answer is, is yes. Um, we can begin looking at bringing in small groups of students in a variety of different situations, as I mentioned before, you know, either foster youth, um, no internet connection, but another thing is those special education programs that are appropriate, we can start working with small groups um, that way as well. So that's good news. It is good news, thank you. So one final question for our epidemiologists tonight. Our numbers are now trending in a positive direction. So how do we keep up the good work? Yeah, so we're very grateful for the partnership with the community. At that community level, that's where that primary prevention that's so important for reducing COVID-19 spread happens. The limiting of social gatherings, social distancing, and wearing those face coverings. So we just ask the community continue to partner with us and help us with those efforts. And especially as we're going into Labor Day, we don't want to see the same spike we saw after the 4th of July. So we ask for your com continued partnership in doing those basic primary public health prevention strategies and helping keep COVID-19 transmission down in Stanislaus County. 
Fantastic. Well, I think we got through a lot of the questions that we uh, received over the course of the last week. So we want to thank all of our panelists for being here tonight and providing the community with this important update on the COVID-19 pandemic and as well as guidance to help keep our families safe. And thank you at home for sending in your questions. If we didn't get to your question tonight, we'll continue to answer them in the social media updates we provide throughout the week. And as a reminder, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for the keyword stand emergency. Thanks again, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed. Good night.